Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Before we begin today's webinar, Osteoporosis Canada acknowledges the land that our offices, located in Toronto or on, is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Awashnabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 and the Mississaugas of the Credit. My name is Tracy Napoli, Director of Fund Development and Marcom at Osteoporosis Canada, and I will be your cooking demo host today. In addition to everyone who will be cooking along, we have webinar attendees and we are also live streaming this webinar on Osteoporosis Canada's Facebook page. So a big welcome to everyone who is watching. This webinar will provide general information about cooking and food knowledge. It is not intended as individualized health and nutrition advice. If you have questions about nutrition, consult a physician or registered dietitian. We would like to acknowledge this project is funded in part by the Government of Canada. Now, during the webinar, if you are watching on Zoom, you can enter questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, or if you are watching via Facebook, you can enter your question in the comments section and we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can during the webinar. So we all know that nutrition is a key component for strengthening and maintaining healthy bones, as well as in the prevention and management of osteoporosis. Calcium, vitamin D and protein are essential nutrients for proper bone health. At Osteoporosis Canada, we are working to provide strategies new ideas and recipes to help you get the bone building nutrients needed to keep bones strong and healthy. And one strategy to help make sure you are getting what you need every day is to um, stock your pantry and freezer with foods that are a source of calcium and protein like canned sardines and canned salmon with the bones, which are a source of calcium and a main ingredient in today's recipe. So a great way to make sure that you have certain foods is to make sure you have a well-stocked pantry and freezer. And some great tips are not to buy everything all at once. You can look for some higher priced items that perhaps are on sale in your grocery store and pick up perhaps one or two things as you're doing your grocery shopping and also to choose some items that are very versatile that you can use in multiple ways. Some great pantry items include powdered milk, evaporated milk, shelf-stable milk and fortified milk alternatives, canned meats and fish, dried or canned beans and nut butters. And of course, in your freezer or refrigerator, you can also um, make sure you have milk, yogurt, cheese, fortified beverages, eggs, and a variety of frozen fruits, vegetables, et cetera. And you can also freeze your fresh ingredients like cheese and milk for use at a later time. So let's get cooking. Our featured recipe today is salmon noodle casserole with 23 grams of protein and 400 milligrams of calcium per serving. You can get this recipe by visiting osteoporosis.ca forward slash recipes. Not to worry though, we will be posting the recipe in the chat and on in the comment section on Facebook. So you'll get that link shortly. But now it's time for me to welcome Emily Richards, a professional home economist, freelance food writer, chef, and the author and co-author of 10 cookbooks. Emily also writes and develops recipes for print, online publications that include everyday cooking and healthy eating, and can be found on TV, radio, and webcasts just like this one. So please welcome Emily. Hey everybody, thanks for joining me tonight. Thanks, Tracy. Um, this is gonna be a fun, easy, and fast dinner tonight. Um, the, it's probably gonna take us longer to talk through the recipe than actually cook it, which is always fun just to prove a point that dinner can be done quick and easy. <laughs> Um, so, um, Tracy, I think that we have, we have a beautiful looking group today. I might, I might just throw that out there. Um, Absolutely. They're all, <laughs> they're all lovely ladies, but that doesn't mean that there aren't men out there that are cooking dinner. And, um, 
Um, there's going to be hopefully lots of questions tonight about pantry staples and how to get calcium into your recipes because this one it has it's a whopping amount of calcium and I think that that's amazing Tracy. Sorry I muted myself. Isn't that the whole thing for the last two years? Are we on mute? Are we not on mute? So before we get started though Emily and I so we have we're, we're so excited to have our cook along participants but not to leave um, our viewers out that are watching um, on the webinar. Sorry Facebook live folks this is just if you registered for the webinar. We are actually going to do a giveaway. So one lucky winner, and you have to uh, be registered and, and still on at the end of the webinar, you're going to get one of our purple proud aprons. So you're going to get one of these and also Emily's newest cookbook, Kitchen Simple. Show us the, show us the cookbook. So you're going to get both. Yay. And one, so I will, I will randomly pick a, 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 a and I will share it at the end. So good luck to everyone. All right, Emily, let's get cooking on this classic retro dish. Let's get everyone yes. cooking. Perfect. So this, um, some of you may have grown up eating tuna casserole, um, and this is kind of uh, a spin on it, a fresh spin on it. We, it's one, it's a one skillet meal, which is makes it even quicker. And we all have our ingredients out ready to go, but nothing's been chopped. So this is a great opportunity to go through some of our chopping um, skills and techniques because it's one of my favorite things to do. So we're going to start off with our vegetables, which are onions, celery, and garlic. And then we're also going to chop our parsley, which is part of the topping as well, because as many of you know, a casserole isn't a casserole sometimes without a topping. So this one definitely has a lovely topping on it. Um, so if you get all your vegetables ready, everybody, I'm just going to pull out my celery. I have, we're using two cloves of garlic. Um, in this recipe, and as with any recipe, I always kind of look it over first, read it, make sure I have all my ingredients out, but I always keep it handy. So I do have a copy of the recipe in front of me because more than likely I tend to forget what's in it, even when it's a short ingredient list. And the onion. We're gonna start off with the onion, but I'm gonna talk about it, the onions because in a recipe, when it specifies the size of a vegetable, in our case, it's a small onion, okay? Um, you can kind of go through your onion pile and see if you have a small onion. So I'm actually holding two onions here just to show you the difference. This is kind of a medium sized onion and this is a small onion. So what do you do if you only have a medium sized onion? Well, here's what you're going to do. You can use half of the onion, which would be closer to a small onion. Or if you love onion, you can use the whole onion. It's totally up to you and how your family enjoys vegetables. So in our case, the onion is going to be a flavor builder right from the get-go. So for all of you that have a medium onion, which I think most of you do, I leave this in your hands. You can cut it in half and use half, or you can use a smaller onion. I'm going to use the smaller onion so that I can show you how to cut the onion completely, okay? Now you'll notice my small onion has a little bit of sprout growing through here because this would really love to kind of regrow some green that's totally okay. It's gonna have a slightly stronger flavor of onion, but I'm okay with that. So we're gonna start off, we want the onion to be flat when we cut it. So I'm gonna just cut off, this is the root end, this is the stem end. I want you to just trim a little flat side of that stem end off so that we can put our onion down flat, okay? And if you have a compost pile handy, um, or if you wanna make stock later, you can put this aside so that you have it, um, the onion, and the skins to go with it. So then with your hands on either side of the onion and your knife, you're gonna cut down right through the root end and cut it right in half so that we have two flat sides. And then you're gonna just peel that papery skin off, okay? Usually it's one layer sometimes, it could be a double layer, which is okay, but you just wanna peel off that outer skin. And we're not trimming off the root end because the root end is actually going to Stay to keep the onion together so when we cut it, it won't fall apart. Okay, so there's my onion skin gone. Sometimes that could be the hardest part is peeling the onion. And then we're going to work with one half at a time. So I want to make sure that I'm going to make lengthwise cuts. So the root end is in the back here. And with the top part or the, the tip of your knife, you're going to make lengthwise cuts in the onion but you're not gonna go all the way down to that root end, okay? Now, if you're not a fan of onion, you wanna cut this up really small, 
these lengthwise cuts you want to keep nice and close together. And in our recipe, we actually call for the onion dice. So we do want it a little bit smaller than a chop. Okay. Got some slippery skin still on there. All right. So then what I'm going to do is hold on tight to my onion and I'm going to use the thicker part, the base of my knife here, and then just start rocking my knife up and down. Hold on nice and tight to your onion. And the tighter, the smaller cuts that you make doing this, you'll get a small dice of onion. Okay. And then as you get closer to the end, that root end, which was the part you were going to cut off, you're going to add that to your compost pile. Okay. I'm just going to push that over and I'm going to do the other half of my onion. Now onions, great pantry staple, great starter to many recipes. Um, and right now the onions that you would get are actually quite fresh because they're this year's crop. So if any of you are crying out there, I don't see any tears happening, so that's good. Um, it's usually because that they are those nice fresh onions. If that ever happens, you could always um, cut the onions in the refrigerator for a little bit before you go to chop them. Um, and that will kind of cool everything so that the, the aroma of the onion doesn't bother you as much. And having a sharp, sharp knife helps too. I'm just going to slice up the rest of that half of the onion and set that aside. So if you have a prep bowl, you can add your onion to it because we're also gonna be adding our celery and our garlic to it. Or if you want, you can put it right in the skillet. Um, we're not starting to cook anything yet. So I'm gonna actually do that so that I have more space on my cutting board, okay? Now, if anybody has questions as we go along, our cook along friends, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, by all means, um, our webinar friends, if you want to use the chat and put a question, um, please feel free to. Um, Tracy will help me out on that end and, and read the questions. Maybe you have a pantry favorite recipe that has lots of calcium or protein in it because that combination is winning and that's what this dish has. All right, we're going to move on to our garlic. So we have two cloves of garlic and I love using fresh garlic and I love chopping it. This is one of my favorite things to do. You probably don't hear that very often, but to me it's very soothing and I love the aroma. So what we're gonna do is take the skin off first and I'm just gonna use the side of my knife to kind of basically bash it, but I don't wanna smash it because I don't want it all over the cutting board. I want the juices from the garlic and the flavor to go in my dish, not on the cutting board. So I just want you to hit it and you should hear a crack. And what that crack is, is the skin popping off. Okay, of the garlic clove. So I'll do that again. And then you should easily be able to peel the garlic skin off. If you need a little bit of help, you can always use a little paring knife. This one's a little bit stuck on the one side. There we go. And just peel the garlic clove. So with the garlic and the onions, again, pantry staples, the start of this casserole will have tons of flavor. Sometimes we you know, forget about the basics and what they, they provide and onions and garlic certainly do that. So that same process that we did with the onion, we're gonna do with the garlic, okay? Except now it's smaller. So we're gonna go in and mainly use the tip of our knife here. So again, I left that root end intact and I'm gonna hold on tight to the garlic clove and make those lengthwise cuts trying to keep it together, not cutting all the way through, then flipping it over and doing those same cuts again. Again, the closer you are when you make these lengthwise cuts, the easier it is to get a nice small mince. And then you're just gonna go up and down, nice and tight again to get your minced garlic. Now, the smaller it is here, you don't have to go back to chop it again. That root end is gonna come off. But if you feel like you didn't do a very good job here, you can just go back with your knife and mince it a little bit smaller, okay? Which is what I'm gonna do. And then that goes into the skillet with my onion. So I'm gonna do one more, same way. This one I kind of hit a little hard, it's a bit broken, so it might fall apart. Flip it over, lengthwise cuts again. And then just nice and tight with your knife, a little mince. 
And in our case, because we want everything to be kind of fine and small, um, doing that little extra chop will give you a finer mint of the garlic, okay? And keep all the flavor of the garlic in our dish. All right, and it's gonna be sticky. So this is when I usually recommend you go to the sink and rinse your knife and your fingers with some cool water, turn the blade away from you and just run it under cool water. And as you're cleaning your knife, you're cleaning your fingers. And that actually helps take away some of that garlic aroma. Although who doesn't want to smell like garlic? Come on, you're making dinner, you want to smell like garlic, it's gonna be amazing. All right, celery, the unsung hero of many dishes. It adds crunch. In our case, we're gonna cook it so it's not so crunchy, but it just adds a lot of texture to this dish. Um, we're gonna get some creaminess in there, but celery, again, I love having it. I add it to soups and stews, and I love just eating it on its own. And in our case, I have one of the outer ribs of celery, okay? So that tends to be a little bit um, firmer, sometimes stringier. So if you're not a fan of that, you can take one of the interior ribs of, of, of celery and use that. If you're okay with using the outside stuff, then by all means, go ahead. You just wanna trim the end, uh, make sure you give it a good wash, and then we're gonna dice it up. So similar size pieces as the onion. So again, this is rocking around. So put it on the side that's not the flat side. And then I'm gonna cut it lengthwise into strips, kind of similar size pieces, and then just dice it up into small little squares. So similar to, what we had for the onion. Now, if you were trying to bulk up your veggies here, you could add some carrots. If you had some carrots you needed to use up. You could also add some zucchini to this, okay? And I would actually get these vegetables, a pepper would be nice in here, get them going in the beginning. Because what we're gonna do is actually cook out some of the water from those vegetables. I'm gonna do the other half of my celery and then dice that up as well, okay? We are adding more veggies later because this is really nice one dish meal where it kind of includes everything. We have veggies, we have protein, we have grains. I think, you know, if you wanted just to, you could have a salad for some extra veggies, it'd be absolutely delicious for a weeknight meal, for a Tuesday night dinner. Honey, that's what we're doing. All right, so onion, garlic, celery in our skillet. Then what we're gonna do is, because we're in chopping mode, I'm going to chop up our parsley. However, we don't need it quite yet. But what we're doing is basically creating our mise en place. We're getting all of our um, ingredients ready so that when we go to cook, we have everything ready, we haven't forgot anything, and it will come together quite quickly, which is nice. So we're using uh, flat leaf parsley. It's one of my favorite fresh herbs because I have it around all the time. And it's just a nice way to add some fresh flavor to many dishes. So we only need a couple tablespoons, so don't need too many stalks or stems of parsley. I think this is probably enough. And I'll just put this aside. And you'll notice that with parsley, it has some tender stems and then the thicker stems down here. You can use the more tender stems, okay, to chop up because they certainly have lots of flavor. But these thicker stems, you can add them to your onion skins and your garlic skins for when you go to make a stock, okay? So these freeze beautifully. Um, if you're not making stock, you can even just freeze your parsley stems and throw them into a pot of soup or stew just to add a little bit of fresh herb flavor, okay? So I'm gonna set those aside. And with fresh herbs, basically, you kind of bring it all together to create a little pile, okay? So you're pinching it all together so it, it comes together in a little pile. And then we're doing that same chopping motion again, where it's just rocking. Your knife is moving, the parsley is not, and you move your fingers away from the knife, okay? Now that would be a fairly rough chop. Because this is a topping and we're using panko breadcrumbs, which are nice and fine, we're gonna go back and chop this a little bit more. Now, if you have a little bit of extra parsley, because two tablespoons is sometimes a little bit hard to guesstimate, that's okay. You'll just have a little bit extra color in your topping, which is totally fine. 
button. There. I'm going to estimate that mine is two tablespoons. Opposite's true too. If you have like one tablespoon, totally okay. You don't have to worry about <clears throat> chopping more unless of course you want to, or you could just chop a bunch of it and then all the extra you have for later uh, for another dish, or if you just want to garnish something. So I'm just going to put this in a little bowl here because we need that after. Um, anytime we're working together in the kitchen and getting recipes ready, I always love to use my work on my vegetables first. It's a matter of food safety and then bring in the protein kind of at the end so that we have everything together. It's also a little less cleanup because then you can get rid of your cutting board. If you were actually cutting um, protein today, then we could you know, set it aside and, and keep working. All right, parsley is good. Now we're gonna measure out our frozen vegetables, okay? How's everybody doing? I saw some chopping, everybody's, I'm not going too fast. Everyone's good, awesome, perfect. Tracy, is everybody good out in uh, webinar land? Do you have any questions that have come up? Well, we, 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 we are getting a couple of questions. So, um, and I, everyone's looking great. I see everyone chopping away. Um, I think one of the comments we got, it wasn't so much a question. Well, maybe it was, uh, it was a comment too. It was basically, I don't like canned salmon. What else could I use? And you know what I would say? I would say, give this a try. Try, this is like, that's what I would say first. Try this recipe um, first before, before you decide, you know, you don't like it. This is a really, I think what I love about this recipe is A, it's not overly difficult. Um, it's a classic recipe. It's a little retro. Um, and we're putting like a new spin on it. And the purpose really is to use the salmon because of the addition. Now there is calcium in the dish. So if you really, really, really did not like canned salmon there, of course, you could make a classic tuna casserole, uh, tuna noodle casserole. But this is something where we're, we're trying to find, uh, give people different options to use the canned salmon with the bones because we get a lot of people saying, I don't like the bones, I don't wanna eat the bones. And so this is why Emily is going to show us why it is so delicious. So what so would you say, Emily? I've said, what, just try the recipe. What would you say? What Tracy is saying is if you don't try it with salmon, you're breaking her heart. Yes, um, and that would no. really hurt her. <laughs> uh, but yes, you, you could definitely, if you're a tuna lover, you could use tuna. When we get to the salmon, I'm going to show you this, the, the main reason why it has so much calcium. Um, but you could also use, and this is a side of what Tracy was saying of leaving the salmon out, but you're still going to get a creamy, essentially side dish is what you're going to get. So you're going to get the, the benefit of the calcium from the cheese that's in it and the evaporated milk. But that's a little it becomes a little bit more of a side dish. So to keep it as a main course, you need that protein element in there to be kind of high. And this one does pack a punch. So you could use some leftover cooked chicken in here. If you had a roast salmon, you could break it up and add it into this. You're not going to get the same level of calcium because those proteins don't have as much as the canned salmon. But you will definitely get a little bit of a fuller meal, um, which is, is what this casserole dish is. So there are some other options. And it is a great place to use up leftovers. Um, and, and in that case, you know, if you're trying to just kind of pick and choose of the pantry items that you have, you could definitely do that. You know, I would say if you had some smoked salmon or smoked fish, um, canned smoked fish would be really nice in here too. It would offer up a bit of smokiness. Um, so if you love that flavor, that would, that would work too. So is that the right answer, Tracy? I think actually, yeah, the smoked salmon sounds good too. Uh, no, I think it is. And I think, I mean, what, when we're developing these, because these are all developed for osteoporosis candidates recipes, Emily works yeah. really hard um, with, with the suggestions that we provide. We want really versatile recipes because we're hoping um, that everyone gets, you know, their bone building nutrients through food sources whenever possible. But also some people, you know, it can't always be the big meal. And this is great if you've got one or two people that you're cooking for. Um, but also we're going to talk about freezer friendly. This is a budget friendly meal as well, because we love, especially me, I love what I can put in the freezer, cook once, eat twice. So, all right, Emily, and let's just see, I'm going to take a quick look at everyone who's, everyone's just waiting for the next step. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking, Emily. Okay, go. perfect. So, everyone we're great. going to, 
we're going to measure out our vegetable broth. Um, you could use chicken broth here. Um, we're using vegetable broth tonight, and we need verify with the recipe. We need one and a half cups. Okay, so um, this is pre ready ready to use vegetable broth, so I don't have to dilute anything here. Um, just a note, when you do have these Tetra packs, it is a good idea to use it up within about a week. Um, if you know that you're not making anything with broth, then what you can do is pour it out into different smaller containers and freeze them or in Ziploc bags and freeze it flat so that then and write on it how much it is so that you can pull it out and add it to a soup or if you're making a sauce and you have it at the ready. Okay. So these, as much as I'd love to say it lasts forever in the fridge, it really doesn't. <laughs> So, but these are a great um, pantry item, especially if you love making soups um, and stews just to have on hand. So our broth is ready to go. We have um, two and a half cups of large or broad egg noodles. So these are those kind of classic noodles that go with um, a tuna noodle casserole or in our case, salmon noodle casserole. And we're gonna cook these right in the casserole dish. So that's kind of the ease of not having that second pot where you have to cook pasta noodles, okay? So we have those measured out and we're gonna open up our cans. I know it's so exciting. And this is, um, these are those pantry staples. So our evaporated milk um, that we're gonna open. And this is just um, regular evaporated milk. You could use a lesser fat evaporated milk, but you're not gonna get that creaminess, which is one of the reasons why I love this dish. So our trusty can opener, we're going to open that, and then we're going to open up our canned salmon. Um, I'm going to try not to have the lid fall in, because that can always be messy. And evaporated milk is something that um, a lot of people think, oh, I use that for baking. And you might, but you may be thinking of sweetened condensed milk, um, which is thick and syrupy. And any of you ever made magic bars or Hello Dollies? You know what I'm talking about because you need sweetened condensed milk. Um, or if you've made the sweetened condensed milk cookies from Kitchen Simple, <laughs> you would need that. But evaporated milk is uh, a fluid milk. And so it's used in a lot of soups um, to kind of add that thickness and creaminess. And it's great because you can keep it in dry storage. So you always have milk on hand. This is something that I remember my grandmother um, would have just kind of handy when people wanted um, to use milk in their coffee because she just thought that's what everybody did. She thought, um, you know, her Canadian friends had all this evaporated milk and they would offer it to her for coffee. And so she had some on hand too. So you may recognize it as something to add to your coffee, which again, if you run out of milk, this is fabulous to have on hand. So in our case, it will kind of build the creaminess in this dish. And we're also going to open up our canned salmon. So this is the sockeye salmon that we're using and it's a wild red Pacific. So what does that mean? That means it's on the Pacific side of Canada. And that's typically where you're going to see that nice bright red um, salmon. So if you love wild salmon, you'll recognize that color, that beautiful red color of it. So we're going to open it. You'll have to keep that lid to take it to the sink because you are going to drain that little bit, I'll just kind of lift this up to show you. There is that little bit of canning liquid in there that we're just gonna drain off because we don't need that for the dish. It's not very much, it's not even a tablespoon to be honest with you, okay? And then just to kind of make it easier for everybody to see, I'm gonna put this out on a plate so that you can see the components. So all my cook along friends, um, you guys can actually start mashing this with a fork. Okay, but when I open it up, and I'm just going to kind of break it up here, you'll see that it's actually chunks of salmon, there's some skin there. Okay. And typically in the center or thereabout, there will be little bits of bone. So I kind of pulled this one out on purpose, I'll just get it really close to the camera there. So that's a little piece of bone. So um, I was telling Tracy earlier when I worked in restaurants, we were always told to remove any bones from any canned fish. And you just do what you're told or you'll get fired. <laughs> so that's what I did. And it wasn't until I started taking uh, nutrition in university that I realized, hey, this is really important. We should be leaving those bones in there. I'm just gonna grab a fork. So the bones due to the processing, um, the canning process of the salmon in here, they get really, really soft. 
So when you hear people talk about the benefits of canned salmon and when it comes to osteoporosis, that's where all the calcium is coming from. And these bones get really, really soft. So all you have to do is mash them together with all the salmon. Now, if any of you want, you can take the skin off um, if you don't want the skin in there. But as you can see, the skin gets really, really soft as well. And I'm just mashing it all together, okay? Now, if you are worried about um, the bones, you can always remove some of the larger ones. But trust me on this, when you use a fork and mash it, they'll be, they'll kind of disappear in there, okay? So I'm just gonna make sure I mash everything together. And you'll notice that, oh, there's a few other little bones here that I just mashed up, so that's perfect. From one, I don't know if you have this, this is kind of an on the spot question, Tracy, I don't know if you have this information, but from one can of salmon, do you know how much calcium comes just from the one can? So if like people like making salmon sandwiches, right. for example. No, offhand, I don't, but what I would, so there's two things I would suggest. So uh, again, really encourage reading product labels because based on the brand, that you are, that you're purchasing, it could be a different amount of salmon in the can. Um, and actually what we did get a question on, and also, sorry, and then you can also go to the calcium calculator on the Osteoporosis Canada website. And we have all different kinds of foods that you can put in. And based on the serving that you're going to eat, it will calculate the, the calcium. But somebody actually sent us a, an advanced question when they registered and said, well, how do I know like what salmon that I'm purchasing has the, has the bones in it. So we do not work for any companies that make salmon in a can. However, based on our <laughs> research, um, what I have found, and you can get on, uh, what I would do is just get on, a, on the website of the product, uh, the brand that you would like to purchase. It actually will say it doesn't have bones. I have not found a can of salmon that actually says it does have bones. However, depending on where you live in Canada, or we actually have some international people as well that are watching, it really depends on, on the brand and the packaging. And sometimes you may just have to buy a can and open it up. And if it doesn't have bones, that's okay. You know, there's other, there's other kind of calcium in here, but that's what I would say in what we have found is, or what I've found when I've gotten on, um, you just, you just have to see where if it's sockeye, it should say, nothing and if it has no bones it'll actually see on the label no bones no skin so there you go it's always good to read those labels um, it really you're is it really is every everybody who's cooking with me tonight get some oil in your pan and turn it on to medium heat because we're gonna actually start cooking we'll still keep talking by the way um because um i always think that this is so interesting i better have a drink i feel a cough coming on Tracy. oh that's okay <clears throat> okay, it's gone now. You good? Awesome. <laughs> I'm good. Um, so when it comes to pantry staples, I think it's amazing because, you know, there's so many things that they get um, pushed aside maybe because we don't think that we can create anything other than salmon sandwiches, for example. Um, and, you know, there's always a classic. I remember there, there was never a bridal shower or sadly funerals that didn't have those finger sandwiches where there's you know salmon salad as part of it so sometimes you get so um fixed on how you remember an ingredient that you can't kind of set it aside for something else so i'm hoping that as much as this is kind of a retro dish that it is new for some of you because you may not have incorporated a can of salmon into something like this um, you can also use canned salmon in pasta dishes. So, you know, this technically is a pasta dish, but if you wanted to have, you know, a nice red sauce, um, you could add a can of salmon to it and add that flavor to it. You could also do it with a white sauce or a wine sauce if you were dressing it up one night. So canned salmon is a great way to feed a family because, the, and just so you know, I'm gonna pull the can back here, um, canned salmon, um, is usually it comes in different size cans so you do want to take a look at that as well and it's typically a larger can size than tuna okay this is 213 grams I think it says on here somewhere yeah right up there okay um, so do kind of keep an eye on that because sometimes 
you're very, if you're, if you're like me sometimes and you know that that's what you want to buy, um, you just, you're kind of quick to, uh, to pick up that can and walk away. Um, and in our case, we want that amount of salmon so that everybody gets a good portion because this um, comfortably feeds, you know, four people for dinner, which is really nice. So we are going to add a little bit more seasoning to our onion, celery, and garlic. We're going to add our dried thyme. So again, another pantry staple. Um, we're going to add half a teaspoon of dried thyme. And this is actually one of one of the favorite dried herbs that I, I probably, if any of you have seen my recipes, sometimes I go crazy with dried thyme, but it really is an all purpose dried herb because it goes with so many wonderful things. And um, with any dried herb that you have in the pantry, make sure that um, you smell it. If it's been around for a couple of years or dare I say 10 or 15 <laughs> years, um, it's not that it really goes bad. What happens is it, lose all the, it loses its flavor. So it doesn't give enough um, to the dish. So you might find that, you know, the half a teaspoon you were using, you might need two teaspoons just to get the flavor. So um, it's always a good idea to kind of refresh your dry herbs when you can, okay? So what we're looking for is to get that flavor going right from the beginning and soften these vegetables. So onions tend to have a lot of water, celery does as well. Um, so we wanna soften these and because we dice them, it's not really gonna take too long. Um, it's only gonna take a few minutes and it, it's a visual here. So what you're gonna look for, I mean, you can definitely give them a little squeeze and see if they're softened, but you're gonna see the transformation of the onion um, that's fairly, opaque white that goes a little bit soft and limp and a little bit more translucent okay so that's kind of a good sign if your onion um, and vegetables start to get a little bit of color that's okay you can just turn the heat down a little bit sometimes um, my butane burner here sometimes gets a little bit overzealous and wants to give everything a little bit of color all right so we're going to is everybody stirring? I see people stirring, so that's good. They're by their stove. We're going to add some other ingredients to this, okay? So we're gonna add our noodles, okay? Dry noodles going in. Then we're going to add our broth that we measured out, our cup and a half. Okay, and then our milk. Is going to go in give that a stir we're also going to add another level of seasoning here we're going to add a little bit of dried mustard or ground mustard um, i know some people refer to it differently um, so we're going to add a half teaspoon of ground mustard now if you're not a fan of mustard this is really just another element of a pantry um, staple that i often use in sauces for a bit of flavor you can leave it out um, you could also, if you didn't have um, dry mustard or ground mustard, you could use a teaspoon of, if you love mustard, a, a teaspoon of Dijon mustard would be lovely in here, okay? Um, even prepared mustard, to be honest with you, give it a nice little zip, give it a little bit of flavor. And then we're also gonna add some black pepper, okay? And I like to add these seasonings into the sauce so that they start to build the flavor in everything. So I'm just gonna grind up some pepper here. and measure out my quarter teaspoon. Okay, there we go. Now, you may be thinking, Emily, you said this was gonna be a really quick dinner. <laughs> it will be when you don't have me talking at you the whole time, I promise. <laughs> I just wanna make sure that everybody gets, you know, gets to the stage together, that we're doing this together. It's kind of nice when you get to cook with people, I think, I, it's one of my favorite things to do. I also like cooking for people. So um, it, it, it's, always, um, it's always beneficial when there's people in the kitchen. All right, so what we want is to bring this to a simmer. So if you need to bump up the heat a little bit, you totally can. Um, and we're gonna just basically be cooking it till the noodles are, are somewhat tender. Now, if you needed to speed this up, um, you could cook it on a slightly higher heat, but there is a chance of the, um, evaporated milk separating a little bit, but we, we don't want that. So how does it get thick if we're not 
um, adding any thickener because I'm sure you noticed there's no flour in here. We're not adding any cornstarch or anything like that. We're dependent on the starch from the noodles. So this is where um, noodles play a big part. If I was using um, a gluten-free noodle, for example, it may not thicken quite as nicely as um, these noodles do. Um, you could also try different types of pasta about the same size. So one of my favorites in comparison to these noodles is a fusilli noodle. They tend to be a little bit smaller and tighter. They take a little bit longer. So if you wanted to switch up the noodle or maybe that's the only pantry staple pasta that you have, um, keep your broth handy because you may need to add a little bit more liquid to the dish, okay? And my mixture is in a nice large skillet. So that means I have lots of surface area here. And the great part about that is that um, it will cook evenly. So it's not kind of in a saucepan that's tall, that's kind of sitting on top of, of each other, okay? So that simmer is happening. It's got some nice little bubbles. And that's really what a simmer is. It just has those nice little bubbles on top. If it's those big kind of rolling um, bubbles, you might wanna just turn the heat down a little bit, okay? And then I just wanna make sure I have the other ingredients which is our salmon that we've mashed up. I have those frozen veggies. Now, we, I kind of skipped over that, but I'm pretty sure everybody <laughs> measured them out at the same time. And the reason why I measured them out um, a little bit earlier is so that they have the opportunity to thaw a little bit, okay? We don't have to cook them because they are gonna um, heat through in the, in the casserole um, as, we, as we cook it all together, okay? So there's our one cup, and these are just diced mixed veggies. So beans, peas, carrots, corn. You could just use peas and corn or just corn, whatever your favorite veggie is. This just adds a really nice bit of color to it as well, okay? So while that's happening, we're going to get our mixture for the topping together. So you'll need your shredded cheddar. Okay, I'm just gonna scooch that over. Your panko breadcrumbs and your parsley for this, okay? Now, I don't want you to just go ahead and mix your breadcrumbs with your cheese because if you look at the recipe, it says that cheese is to be divided because we need some of that cheese to go into the casserole as well, okay? And at this time is a good time to turn on our broiler <laughs> because that's usually the part I forget. Um, it takes, mine takes a little bit of time to heat up and I know that's the case for some others. So in this recipe, if you look at it, it says to broil it for a few minutes. And if you're thinking, well, why would I broil it for so long? It's about the distance of the broiler to your casserole, or in our case, the skillet, okay? Um, I've specified at least four inches. So it's not right up underneath the broiler, it's got some distance so that it's a nice slow um, golden color that will come through. And also, it also keeps the casserole warm as it's doing that. Okay, so if any of you don't have your broiler, um, your, your top rack, your top shelf of your oven, um, drop it down a bit so that it's at least four inches from the broiler. And then you can turn your broiler on um, to warm up. And I know some ovens are finicky. So if you have to crack the oven door open a little bit, you can. Okay, I hope it's smelling great in your kitchen. And I hope that you can kind of see how this the noodles are starting to absorb and get plumper and that this mixture is getting saucier and thicker. Okay, I'm going to, what's the easiest thing for me to do? I'm going to do this. I'm gonna put my panko breadcrumbs in with my parsley and then I'm gonna take a half a cup of my cheddar cheese and just set it aside. So half the amount of cheddar cheese. And this is old cheddar because I like to have that deep flavor of cheddar. Also adding to the amount of calcium that we're getting in this dish, which is really nice. Okay, and then I'm just gonna mix about half a cup of cheese with our panko breadcrumbs and our parsley. I'm just gonna get a spoon to stir that up. How's everybody doing? I see movement, I see people, I get thumbs up, that's perfect. Do we have any other questions? Tracy, right now? We, we do, but I just, yeah, like you, I wanted to check in on everyone. I see Lisa's mixing away, and we've got Kate and Ranny and Jody and Paula. 
and Natalie. Everyone good? Yeah. Everyone I'm awake? You can also unmute yourself if you have a question. <laughs> I have a quick question, Emily. Um, you did something that made me really happy. Um, then that was putting the onions, the celery, the garlic in the pan, and then adding oil and then turning it on instead of preheating oil, which I've always thought I had to do. I don't have to do that. <laughs> okay, that's just between me and you right now that you don't okay. have to do that. No, it, you definitely, in this case, no, it really, it's a small amount of oil and everything's kind of heating up at the same time. It's kind of um, the way recipes are written. It, it makes sense for people to get the skillet on the stove, get the oil hot. In our case, because we're not actually browning any of the vegetables, we don't really need that oil to be hot before they go in. So you can heat it up together. So let's say you were making a pasta sauce that had onions and garlic and you wanted them to be soft, you could do the exact same process. If you were caramelizing something where you needed that kind of um, sugar to come out and everything to be a little bit more golden, then definitely I would put the oil in, heat it up a bit and then add the onions. Does that make sense? That makes all kinds of sense. And that makes me so happy. I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> Awesome. And really, and really, when you're making a one skillet meal, you don't really want to spend time heating the pan, right? Like, I mean, it's going to take, in some cases, 30 seconds. If you have a really great stove top, then, you know, it's going to happen in 30 seconds. Some even faster, maybe. Um, gas tends to work pretty, pretty quick for me, which works well. So yes, in this case, for sure, we're, we're golden on that. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. You're welcome. So how are you gonna tell if these noodles are cooking? You're gonna to have to taste one. I'm sorry, you'll have to commit to tasting a noodle. But if you take a look at my pan, you can kind of see that it's definitely thicker. The noodles are definitely more prominent than they were originally. So I'm just gonna steal a noodle here. Don't burn yourself. They're just about there because you want them to be tender, but you still want them to have texture because we still have to add a few things to it. Um, and this can, it usually takes about, you know, eight to 10 minutes. Um, it sometimes will depend on the brand of noodles that, you, um, that you're using, okay? But you can see that it's, this is really, you know, if you wanted to just add the salmon and scoop it right out of the skillet, you don't have to put the topping on it, okay? Um, that's just something that I love having that added crunch to it because we're going to get all this creamy richness from the, um, the noodles and the, and the casserole itself. Okay. So Tracy, I totally ignored you there. Um, if there were any other questions. <laughs> no, you did. And that was great. I'm glad that Kate, Kate, she got her question answered. So I, we've got two questions. So I'm going to ask them at the same time because they're both about the evaporated milk. So the first okay. part. Um, the first question is, if somebody only had 2% milk at home and didn't have evaporated milk, could they use the 2% milk? And then the other question is, is there another option? So a, a, an alternative option that would work? And I'm not okay. sure if there's a flavorless alternative option. I'm thinking that would maybe be a competing factor, but let us know. Like, uh Okay, so if you're using milk, which the fluid milk tends to be, um, because this is evaporated slightly, it kind of gives you a head start. And typically you don't have to add a thickener to it. That's the benefit of evaporated milk. Um, so if you were just using 2% milk, the first of all, you need the amount of the can, which is, I'll do a quick little, it's 354 mils. So you're going to need, do the math, Emily, in my head. So 250 mils is one cup plus another 100 mils, so that's about another. So, so you're gonna need approximately a, a cup and a half of fluid milk. I want you to whisk about a tablespoon of flour into that milk before it goes in here, okay? Because what that's gonna do is help create that same texture um, in, the, in the dish itself, okay? Because, um, the, and same goes if you wanted to use 1% milk or skim milk because you're, you're losing that fat and that creaminess based on those fluid milk. And evaporated milk is also fluid milk, just a slightly different thing. Um, before I answer the next question, I need to taste another noodle because this is pretty much ready for me to add the salmon. I can tell just by looking at it and also just because I wanted to eat some more. Um, once you get this nice texture, you can see how thick it is. Taste the noodle for tenderness. You're gonna add your salmon. 
this is when you don't want to be talking to your family. You just want to get everything in there <laughs> so that everyone can eat. Your veggies go in and that half a cup of cheese that I set aside, just the cheese, not the breadcrumbs, that all goes in, okay? And you're going to stir that all together. So this is really where the hardiness of this casserole comes together and also the color, which is really nice, okay? So the other question about um, other options. Now I'm guessing if you want another option for evaporated milk outside of fluid milk, could it be, is it maybe because of a non-dairy issue, like a dairy issue? Right, yeah, they were asking, you know, is there an opportunity to use uh, a non-dairy um, milk or fortified beverage? But what do you think? Is there one that doesn't have the flavor? Like I'm thinking almond wouldn't be great or coconut. Well, it, it really depends on your family. I mean, if you are accustomed to using these non-dairy beverages, you're used to it. So you already know what that flavor is like but you're gonna to have to treat it very similarly similarly to the 2% or 1% milk because of its fluidity. So you will need a little bit of, of starch. So that's what that flour will do. And you can do it the exact same way where you whisk it in. And the reason why you're whisking it in first is to get make sure that it all comes together so that when you add it to this and stir it, it doesn't end up being lumpy, okay? Um, so yes, I would just basically, do the same process with a non-dairy beverage, provided that you know that it will have a slightly different flavor because at this point, the flavor that we're getting is the salmon that's more pronounced and that little bit of cheese that goes in, okay? So once you have everything in here, you can turn it off because everything's cooked. And if you're hungry, start eating because you can, but we're actually gonna go that little bit of a deeper step here and sprinkle on our panko cheese and parsley mixture, okay? Now, if you notice, I love topping. So there's a lot of topping on here, but that's because I love the crunch, okay? So all around, and then you're going to put this under the broiler. And you will have to be patient because I don't have one that's done. This is, this is it. So I'm gonna put it under the broiler. Now, some people have asked, um, because this recipe is up on the, on the Austria Process Canada site, um, some people have asked if they can make this ahead. And you can definitely make it ahead, but what I would do is actually transfer the mixture to um, a baking dish, just to make your life easier, because putting a skillet in the fridge is not always very easy. Um, and then tuck it in the refrigerator, don't broil it. Um, just make everything ahead put the topping on and then put it in the fridge. And then when you go to warm it up, just put it, cover it with foil and then put it in a 350 degree oven so that it heats everything through. And then if you want, you can still broil the top. It'll probably need, need less time just because it's already in the oven. Um, and then you can just broil it a bit to get that little bit of color on it, which is really nice. But my, my favorite part is that crunch and also the addition of the cheese that's in that, that topping, which is really nice. Emily, what about freezing it at that point? Is this a freezer friendly dish? Can we do that? You can freeze it. What will happen is, and this happens typically with um, anything that you add milk that doesn't have any thickener um, to it, is that it may kind of separate a little bit. The bonus is we, because we have the cheese in there, which has a little bit more fat in it, it will help bind it together. Um, so you could definitely, and if you need this for a few lunches, so if it's just one or two of you at home and you need some lunches, package it in smaller containers and freeze it so that when you take it out, it's just that single serving. And then you can, if it's cooked through and then you portion it out, you just pop it in the microwave to heat it up. Or again, same process, put it in the oven to heat through the same way. So as I said, this is a recipe that easily would serve four. Um, so if you are a smaller household, by all means, you could always, you know, take some and freeze some and set it aside. That that cheese in there, cheese is always a friend, um, especially a high fat cheese like, or a higher fat cheese like cheddar, where it kind of protects um, what you're putting in the freezer with it. I got to make sure that I don't burn this, Tracy. <laughs> We, we did have that happen once, but it, it adds yes. flavor, right, Emily? That it just sure does. It. See? 
I here. caught it in time. I caught it in time. This time I caught it in time. But this is what you're looking for, this kind of nice golden brown. And if you take a look at my skillet, it's kind of brown over here, but not over here. Such is life with a broiler. So you will have to turn it a little bit. So I'm going to just put it back in and get the other side. And that's why it's better to have the pan further away because what it's doing is it's slowly melting the cheese instead of just basically crisping everything up and adding color right away. Um, we didn't add any oil or butter to the topping. You totally could if you wanted to, but I find that the, the fat in the cheese really helps kind of keep it all together and add that crunchiness to it, which is nice. That's great. We have a question about the topping. So if somebody yeah. wanted to make a gluten-free topping, how could we... Yeah make a gluten-free topping to have a gluten-free dish. Okay, well, you'll, you'll need two gluten-free, actually a couple gluten-free items. You will need to make sure that your broth is gluten-free uh, because that is something that isn't always gluten-free. If you're using homemade, then you should be okay. Um, and look for a gluten-free noodle. They tend to cook slightly different in the, these types of casseroles because they don't have, um, obviously the gluten, they don't have the, the flour in there. So they don't absorb the liquid quite the same. So it may be a little bit um, runnier, but that's okay because you just add more cheese <laughs> to thicken it up. And then there is actually um, a, a few different brands of really nice gluten-free breadcrumbs um, that you can use. And they don't have to be panko. They could just be a dry breadcrumb. Um, some of them use a corn-based bread to make those gluten-free crumbs. And just go through and, and work the same um, same amount and the same process and it will work really nicely. There we go. Now it's a little bit more even. Okay, so we have a little bit more of that more golden. The cheese is kind of melty and perfect. Now, if you want it a bit saucier, basically you just have to undercook the pasta, the noodles a little bit. Okay, but it, this is really meant to be kind of that stick to your rib type casserole where you spoon it out and you just enjoy it. So um, I guess I should spoon some out, Tracy. You go ahead and you do that because we always love Emily to taste it. But for everyone else, did you all pull out your, your casseroles? Show us if you can, show us your finished product or is anyone eating theirs yet? <laughs> Tilt it That's up, let's possible. see. Oh, look at that. Oh, I can see Pam. Oh, that looks really good. In oh, Lisa's that looks awesome. And That's awesome. You guys did an oh. amazing job. I hope That's you enjoy. Great. That is so great. I made mine gluten-free, just so you know, gluten-free noodles and gluten-free breadcrumbs. That's awesome, That's Lisa. So how long did, did, it, did the noodles take about the same amount of time? Well, I took a little longer. I used a few silly. They took longer and I had to add a little bit more broth. Okay. You always cook a little bit different, like you said, but yeah, that's, that's, all that's great. That's awesome. So see, whoever asked, now, you know, Lisa tested it for us and it worked. And that means I know that everyone in our house can eat it because sometimes that's what we do, right? We have family members that have different dietary needs and you just have to realize that some dishes can actually be changed up a bit and they'll work for everyone. I need a fork, Tracy. Okay, you go ahead. I, we, we had someone else who also, you know, asked about a different topping. So here's the thing. Again, the versatility. It's also to your personal taste. If you want to use some fried onions on top, go ahead. Right, Emily? It's really, mm -hmm. Emily, how is that? That does look delicious. Can you hear me crunching? Because I feel like it's really loud. <laughs> <laughs> it looks really, really good. But I think, is, I think that's very good. Big, right? You, you can just adjust it to, to whatever you, you want, um, to, to whatever your taste is. If you like it spicy, you can make it spicy. But really, these recipes were just, you know, it's, it's helping you get those nutrients. And also, so it's delicious. And as Emily said, when we're not chatting, this will go a lot quicker. So this it will. is a quick, a quick dinner for, um, for any <laughs> night, for Tuesday night. But I did want to also mention, so we have other recipes on the Osteoporosis Canada website, ones that recipe uh, that Emily developed. We have uh, salmon and chickpea patties, and we have a salmon loaf. Again, really easy recipes using canned salmon. 
with the bones. So if you really like this, there are other recipes on the website that you can get. And so, I mean, Emily, you're, you're just, let's check one before we, before we wrap up. Everyone good? You're all ready for dinner tonight? Thank you so much. You all look amazing in your, in your purple aprons. And speaking of which, before we go, Emily, we're going to give yeah, away- Yeah, we have prizes. We have to give away prizes. prizes. We're gonna, you're going to get an apron and you're going to get uh, Emily's new cookbook, Kitchen Simple, because that's the goal is to have Kitchen Simple. And I'm going to tell you in a second. I'm just, let me just see. So we're going to, uh, so the winner is Louisa Newbury of Toronto. Congratulations. I will reach out after the webinar and you're going to get both of these items. We thank everyone. Um, I'm just gonna pull up. So, so don't go anywhere, everyone. Uh, we have other webinars coming up. Um, we have a, a protein and bone health webinar with Dr. Deborah Butt and Shelly Hagen, who's a registered dietitian. There's still time to register. These are all free webinars, Monday, November 29th. We also have a cooking demo with Emily. So it's another great way to learn about using different ingredients. It's a surf and turf rolled roast beef with horseradish herb sauce. It sounds fancy, but it's actually really simple. And that's Tuesday, December 7th. We have other um, webinars coming up. So the best thing to do uh, would be to subscribe to the national e-newsletter and to register for any of these webinars or any other webinars, just visit osteoprosis.ca forward slash events. And to calculate your calcium, I mentioned this earlier, you can get visit the website and calculate your calcium with the cal calcium calculator. We have podcasts. We also are recording this webinar. You can watch uh, previously recorded webinars on the OC Replay webpage. And November is osteoporosis month. So we want everyone to know their risk. We want everyone to make bone health a priority. So um, if you've already taken the Know Your Risk quiz, please share that with friends and family so that they can learn about their risks of the disease and how to reduce them. And again, uh, just thank you to Emily. Uh, thank you to our partners. Thank you to our, our cook along participants and to everyone watching. Uh, Visit our website, again, subscribe to get information, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we hope that everyone has a wonderful evening. Enjoy your dinner if you've made this, and we hope to see you again soon. So take care, everyone. See Thanks, you again. Everybody. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Grace. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Cook Along participants. Take care. Bye, everyone. Enjoy your dinner. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks.